I want to welcome you to, uh, to our panel here at Hudson Institute this afternoon. My name is Lee Smith, and I'm a senior fellow here. And I want to introduce, um, first of all, my fellow panelists. Uh, first of all, to my immediate left is Michael Duran, who's also a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute. To his left is Hussein Abdul Hussein, uh, who, among other things, is the uh, bureau chief, Washington bureau chief for a Kuwaiti uh, daily newspaper called Arai. And to his left is Tony Badran, a research fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Um, among other things, these are all people that uh, I consider dear friends as well as colleagues, and I've learned from them a tremendous amount, especially about especially about the subject that we're going to be discussing today, which is about, uh, in particular, in particular, Lebanon. Um, Tony and Hussein are both uh, are both from Lebanon. Um, we're st we're using the tenth anniversary of the assassination of Rafiq Hariri as, a, as an occasion to speak about what's happened specifically to Lebanon over the last decade, more generally what's happened in the Middle East, uh, especially, regarding, uh, especially regarding the uh, Iranian project in the region, as well as U.S. foreign policy, the response to it. The other thing I want to say is I, I, there, I, I, I also see certain friends here who I've spoken with about Lebanon in the past and, and, and Lebanese friends. And also it's sort of, uh, I just want to note that it's also sort of a sad occasion um, because it is the, does mark the 10th anniversary, February 14th, 2005, of the assassination of Hariri, an important figure, uh, also a very uh, positive influence on the region in lots of ways. And 10 years after <laughs> his, his assassins, and people know who they are, uh, they're on trial in absentia at, uh, at, in The Hague, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, but as to date, his murderers still walk free, and the real uh, awful, uh, pitiful irony is that the United States, the Obama administration, is in various ways teamed up with his murderers right now around the region. Um, so I'm sorry to start on a very sour note, but I want to put, uh, I want to put that um, in an immediate context so you understand how far we've gone over the last decade. Um, I'm going to ask the three panelists to give a brief introduction, seven to 10 minutes after that. Uh, we'll open it up for more general conversation. And then I hope and I trust that we will have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes at the end to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, right now, I'm gonna ask um, Michael, uh, Michael Durant to go first. Mike, thanks. Thanks, Lee. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. I thought what I would do uh, is just um, make a few remarks about the uh, the context in which the United States makes policy toward uh, toward Lebanon. I I was um, I wasn't in the White House when uh, when Hariri was assassinated, but I came in a few months later. So I was there from 2005 to 2007, um, and um, saw the the debate in the White House about uh, what to do about um, the assassination and the um, the uh, it's the effects uh, of it and what to do about Lebanon more uh, more broadly. Uh, and then I've watched closely as the U.S. policy has shifted um, over the last few years. Uh, the, the sad truth is, and I think this is a, a, a truth um, that is constant for every American administration, whether it's Republican <coughs> or Democrat, um, the sad truth is th that the U.S. Uh, does not have a Lebanon policy. Um, uh, th this is just the, the consequence of being a great, uh, a great power. The Lebanon, po the Lebanon policy is always um, uh, a, um, um, a consequence of positions that are taken toward larger issues, like the, uh, the policy toward Iran, the policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict, the policy toward Syria, um, and, and so on. Um, if you go back to the, uh, before I came into the White House, um, and, and you remember the March 14th movement in, um, in Lebanon, the uh, movement against the against the Syrians and in favor of Lebanese independence and uh, for um, greater democracy in Le in, uh, in Lebanon, the March 14th um, movement um, gained a lot of strength from the um, uh, U.S. invasion of uh, um, uh, of Iraq and from um, the democracy promotion, the the freedom ag uh, of the Bush administration, what the Bush administration called the the freedom agenda, uh, but. Uh, but it came as a complete surprise to the uh, uh, to the White House. Um, Lebanon was uh, was in in fact kind of an afterthought. Uh, the March 14th movement and uh, all that it represented 
um, um, was a was a tremendous benefit to the to the Bush administration um, and, it, and to its its perspective on the um, on on the Middle East. But the administration wasn't expecting it, and and when it when it when it when it uh, developed spontaneously, wasn't quite sure at first what to um, what to do about it. The, but the the basic paradigm that the administration had was one in which uh, it, it, it the president, especially I should say, the president Bush, <coughs> saw the role of the United States as uh, supporting its allies in the region um, against Iran, which it saw as a um, um, as a revisionist power, um, and also, of course, was was uh, dedicated to fighting against Al Qaeda. But it it saw Al Qaeda and Iran as twin threats, and saw the United States, the goal of the United States, to build up those powers in the region that were interested in encountering those um, those powers. In a very interesting article um, that Martin Indyk, the head of uh, foreign policy at Brookings, wrote in the last um, couple of days, um, he says that. There are basically today, for the Obama administration, two key choices. Um, he calls them the, 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 the key choices the, um, uh, the condominium with Iran versus back what he calls back to the future, which is going back to that Bush concept, uh, which Bush inherited from his predecessors, of building up the alternatives to Iran in, in, in the region. Um, I would commend that article to you. It's on the Brookings website, Brookings blog, and um, I completely agree with Martin Indyk. Those are the two, those are the two choices. And he's suggesting there that President Obama has moved away from them. He re he rejects the notion that, um, as Lee suggested just now, that President Obama has aligned with Iran. He says actually what's going on is that President Obama is refusing to choose. The, but the fact of the matter is that Iran is now the rising power in the region. So even if Martin Indyk is correct, and actually I don't agree with him on this, but let's just say he is correct, the refusal to choose, the refusal to choose the old policy of building up allies is a choice in favor of Iran, whether the president regards it that way, um, or, way or not. And the implications for Lebanon are grave uh, because what it means is the, the United States, whether intentionally or uh, by this resolute refusal to refuse, as Martin Indyk, uh, refuse to choose, as Martin Indyk calls it, uh, the United States is has placed its power in support of Iran, the rising power, which which means that that Hezbollah and its Iran and its Iranian supporters, um, who I think everybody on this panel regards as the um, as the assassins of Rafiq Hariri, um, are in the driver's seat in um, in Lebanon. Um, and unless there's a paradigm shift in Washington about the whole place of Iran in the region, um, and a, a return to the decision to fight. Sunni extremism, um, like the Islamic State, and Iran simultaneously, then unfortunately the United States is going to be tilting toward Hezbollah in Lebanon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. Uh, I can't remember, guys. I'm sorry if we made a decision. Tani, why don't you, why don't you go? Actually, is that okay? okay? Thanks. They're Lebanese. Why don't you make them fight with each other? <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Where's the guns? <laughs> um, well, Lee, thanks very much, and thanks uh, to Hudson uh, for hosting this, um, this event. Um, one of the interesting things about, um, about what happened since Hariri died in the last 10 years um, is, uh, and notice I used Hariri died in quoting my uh, good friend uh, Josh Landis uh, on this issue. Um, when Hariri, since Hariri was killed, uh, uh, what happened was um, an interesting phenomenon took place with how people in Lebanon but also in the region uh, began to regard uh, Hezbollah specifically. Uh, and it's a fascinating, uh, for someone who, who works on Hezbollah, I mean, it's fascinating to look at, uh, at how that played out. Um, right before and around the time of, uh, of, of the assassination, uh, there were very specific views about Hezbollah. And um, after <coughs> March 14th, when uh, you know, there's this big movement, um, actually February, after, in, during February, when there was still the buildup towards the big March 14 uh, rally, uh, there was a lot of hope in, in Lebanon among a lot of the commentators, including people in the March 14 movement, that somehow Hezbollah now would you know, take this moment and uh, move to become really integrated in Lebanon m much more than, um, than it had been before you know, as a tool, reject the Syrians, see that the Syrians are gone now, 
and there's no need to be aligned with them and just kind of join this national consensus uh, uh, in Lebanon. Um, they were obviously sorely, sorely mistaken, but what this, rep this view represented actually a, a broader consensus in academia and in policy circles about how uh, Hezbollah was moving towards more integration into Lebanon and so on. And in the last 10 years, what we've seen really <clears throat> is this great unmasking. Uh, and people started to see that, wait a second, this is a group that everybody who was saying, well, no, these guys believe in the export of the Iranian revolution. Uh, these guys uh, are a, a tool of the Iranians, that these guys are not really a Lebanese actor. I mean, they may be Lebanese, but they have not a Lebanese agenda and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, all the older um, points of consensus started collapsing you know, by, by facts on the ground, leading up to Hezbollah's intervention in the Syrian war which a lot of people at first thought wouldn't happen and then would, were denying or minimizing and then all of a sudden Hezbollah comes out and, and openly endorses it um, to also uh, seeing something that has come much more to uh, prominence now, uh, which is really the model when Hezbollah talks and the Iranians talk about exporting the revolution. What is it that they actually mean? So a lot of people focus um, and have focused in the past when discussing this and when discussing Hezbollah's Lebanonization and, and so on, that really uh, it's about putting veils on women and you know banning alcohol and setting up an Islamic state. It's not at all what the, Isla what the Isla exporting the Islamic revolution model is. When Qasem Soleimani today says we're, export the, we're seeing the export of the revolution from Yemen to Iraq to, you know, to Syria, None of these places is an Islamic Republic at all, actually. So what is he talking about? He's actually talking about something very, very specific. Um, and that's what Hezbollah, over the last 10 years, we've seen what exactly that model is. A, you have a, uh, a militia movement that's, on the one hand, parallel to the state, with a direct tie to, to Iran. Um, B, um, it has a, what's called the Basij model, in reference to the Iranian paramilitary group. Uh, which is basically a, a, a paramilitary force whose, whose um, f fundamental function is to make sure that nothing in society uh, uh, sort of intervenes in the way of the, of the project that, that the Iranians are, are setting up. So whenever there's anyone on the streets, let's say, protesting, these guys come in and, and, and beat them up. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we saw it in uh, May 8th, you know, when they invaded the, uh, 2008, when they, in, when they invaded uh, the, um, or is it 2007? I can't remember, May 8th. Eight, uh, 2008. 2008. When they, when they sort of took to the streets and rounded up people and shot people and killed people. You know, you stay in line. That's what the besiege force does. You put people in line. And then you have the, mil the infiltration of the states uh, and of the central government and of state institutions, specifically the military. And uh, you grab control over the security policy and the intelligence uh, apparatuses. Uh, w and then you direct those without being part of them. You're still on the outside, but you direct how these things move. So all of a sudden, you have a parallel structure to the state that at simultaneously dominates the state in institution. And it becomes de facto sort of an interlocutor with the outside world. And that's really the, the system right now that uh, the Obama administration is de facto aligned with in Iraq, uh, in Lebanon, probably, you know, we'll see if it works out in Yemen as well and so on. So now the, Ele the Lebanese armed forces, for instance, as a result of this uh, policy, uh, become, you know, the strike force and the extension of a, of a broader Iranian and Hezbollah-led uh, policy in, in, in Lebanon. So all of this happened in, in a relatively quick period, but uh, people really haven't, have, it's, it's astonishing to compare now what Hezbollah does very openly uh, since, since the 10 years uh, after this, uh, since the assassination 10 years ago, and what used to be completely unthinkable for people to even contemplate or write about uh, 10 years before, uh, how Hezbollah is an expeditionary force across the region, how it has cells from ev everywhere, from Latin America to, uh, uh, to the Far East, and they openly talk about it. And, the, and, the, and Nasrallah comes out and says, yes, we are in Iraq. Yes, we are in Syria. Yes, we are in Yemen. Um, so I think one of the, that's the if we're going to look at a legacy of the last 10 years, it's this great unmasking of, uh, of uh, Hezbollah uh, uh, and of the true nature of the Iranian project. 
And that's why it's important that, uh, that it happened in Lebanon in the beginning, because now this is the sort of the crown jewel of the Iranian project that we're seeing across the region, and that's what it was spawned in Lebanon. And so in, 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 in many ways, it's, we've come back full circle uh, to, um, to, to essentially to the early 1980s, what, what, what the Iranian project was conceived as and how it was planted in Lebanon, and now we're seeing its repercussion region-wide. So I think I'll stop there. Tony, thanks very much. That's terrific. Uh, Hussein, if you'd like to... Thanks. Yes, thanks, Lee. Uh, well, I'll add to uh, what Tony has been saying uh, about the role of Hezbollah, except that I'll look at it from uh, the Syrian angle. Uh, I think that uh, many people, especially in this town, tend to assume that, uh, uh, that the, the Assads, the, the both, both Assads, and Iran uh, are uh, like one unit. Uh, I don't think they are. And I think uh, there was a huge change between the two Assads, at least in terms of character and in terms of, of relations uh, with, uh, with Iran. Uh, Assad, the father, Hafiz Assad, uh, was very aware that uh, he might not be uh, on the same page with Iran sometimes. Uh, he kept a lid on Hezbollah in 1987, uh, February 24, um, almost 20, 28 years ago, there was what came to be known as the Fatallah Barak's massacre. Fatallah Barak's was the headquarters of Hezbollah. Uh, the Syrian troops stormed the headquarters. 23 Hezbollah uh, 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 people were killed. Uh, the Syrian commander was Jama Jama, who was the same uh, uh, officer who was in charge of Beirut's security when Hariri was assassinated in February 14, 2005. Uh, so uh, uh, Hafez Assad stormed uh, Hezbollah in 1987. He killed them. Ghazi Kanaan, uh, the, the Syrian chief in Lebanon at the time, and for a long time, issued a statement saying that he will not allow any gunman in the city of, the, of Beirut that year. Now, when did Hafez Assad decide to move on Hezbollah, that, that, that would be very telling. He moved just a few days after Iran had launched its, uh, one of its Fajr operations, it was probably Fajr 7 or 8, I think, uh, uh, against Basra. Uh, the Iranians were 10 kilometers away from Basra. Uh, the, 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 the Iraqis were freaking out, and more specifically, uh, the Arabs in the Gulf were freaking out that the, the Iranians might take Iraq's biggest city, and that was when Hezbollah moved. Uh, he knew that the Iranians were weak. He knew that the Arabs were begging him. Uh, Hafiz, uh, Hafiz Assad uh, just walked on the fence all the time. Uh, after he moved, the Iranians sent him uh, their senior officials to Damascus. He made them wait for a few days, and then after that, he let them in, and he set the rules. He said, okay, you can have your asset in Lebanon, but I call the shots. Um, a few years after that, after the end of the Civil War, in uh, September of, nine, of 1993, um, there, were, there were the Oslo uh, Accords between the Palestinians and the Israelis, the, the Madrid Peace Treaty, uh, Peace Conference, excuse me, was, was on, and uh, of course Hezbollah and Iran were totally against all of this kind of peace talks with Israel. Uh, they organized a, a, a rally and uh, the, the Lebanese army, which was at the time completely under the command of the, of the Syrian Corps, um, uh, opened, fired, and killed 13 Hezbollah people uh, in September 1993 in what came to be called as the Airport Bridge Massacre. So you have 87, you have 93, and then in 1996, during Operation uh, uh, Graves of Wrath, the war between Hezbollah and Israel, one of the wars, um, Hezbollah was being supplied through Hafez Assad, and when, the Hezbo when, when Assad felt that the Hezbollahis might not uh, heed his advice on when to stop shooting, he just withheld uh, the rockets that he used to supply them. So you have three examples, 87, 93, and 96, and Hafez Assad was really keen on doing his things when his, when his allies needed him the most. That was the time when he extracted the highest price. Hafez Assad was, was, a, was a masterful, skilled politician who always uh, uh, conducted politics on the edge. Uh, starting 1998, it was reported that uh, Hafez Assad uh, uh, gave the Lebanon file 
or um, uh, to uh, hand it over his the Lebanon file to his son Bashar Assad. Uh, one of the first things Bashar did was to force Hariri out of government. Uh, Hariri resigned, and that was probably a, a preview of what was to come uh, many years later. But another thing that uh, that uh, Assad did that was uh, totally different from what his dad did, uh, Assad first tried to replicate uh, the uh, military regime of his father in Lebanon. Hafez Assad never tried to do that. Hafez Assad ruled Lebanon mainly through Hariri, Jumblat, and, and the big guys who were there. Uh, he had a system. He created rivals for these big guys. Uh, if he had to kill, he killed. If he had to extort, he extorted. If he had to push rivals, he pushed rivals. He, he even threw people in prison, <coughs> sent them into exile in France and other places. So Hafez Assad ruled through the notable leaders, the sectarian chiefs of Lebanon. Bashar Assad didn't. He was arrogant. Uh, he thought he can uh, teach everyone a lesson. He, he tried to replicate the military establishment of Syria by creating puppet officers in Lebanon through Emil Lahoud and Jamil Sayyid and uh, all the officers who uh, later became famous. Uh, that was one of the mistakes. Now, the biggest mistake that Bashar Assad committed that I, I believe was his biggest mistake was that he threw his lot behind Hezbollah. He put all of his eggs with Iran and the Hezbollahis, uh, something that his father uh, Hafiz never did. Uh, when, when Bashar Assad did that, he became totally dependent on the power of Hezbollah. Uh, after the assassination of Hariri, all of Assad's power in Lebanon went through Hezbollah. They called the shots and, and he had no power. I think that was also a preview of what would, what would uh, 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 happen in Syria. And now we know that in so many uh, fronts and territories, it's Iran and Hezbollah, like uh, in, in southern Syria right now, it's Iran and Hezbollah who are calling the shots. And, and uh, Bashar Assad is, is, is only playing uh, uh, the role of a support through air force and maybe some artillery. Uh, so what's happened in the move between and, and the transformation between uh, Hafez Assad and Bashar Assad was that the Assads were the kings of Syria and Lebanon under Bashar and under, uh, under Hafez, I'm sorry. And then under Bashar, uh, the Assad became only a viceroy, an Iranian viceroy over these two countries. And that was a major shift to my mind. Hussein, thanks very much. That's terrific. Actually, I want to I wanna follow up a question <coughs> and starting with you, but then I want uh, both, of, uh, both Tony and Mike to answer as well. And lots of the times we sort of understand the region right now in terms of different dynamics, in terms of large blocks of power moving in different ways. But Hussein, one of the things that I'm taking from what you're saying is that it's actually a difference. Personalities play a huge role as well. So going from Hafez to Bashar, and we see like there are different ideas about what's happened in the region. And also, I mean, I think that one of the ways I, I, I did, I, I have thought about the assassination is that in some ways, we don't have to say it gave rise to the Syrian conflict, but we can see it as some sort of an indicator or something like that. So I guess I would just like you to address that. Like, how much do we look at uh, different personalities and how much we look at actual regional dynamics? Look, I know that there are the people who are driving, driving regional dynamics, but I'd like to talk, just focus a little bit on the, on the actual players who are making decisions. You want me to start? Yeah, first? yeah, if, if you um, could start with this. Yeah, well, of course, uh, personalities count. Um, what we know from uh, Abdel Halim Khaddam, the, the foreign vice president of Syria, who, who worked with Hafez for uh, so many decades, and then he defected under Bashar, uh, what he said was that uh, when there was a disagreement between uh, the Hariri and the Jumblat camp and, and Bashar Assad's camp, and, or the Lahoud and, 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 and the supporters of Assad in Lebanon, uh, there were a few suggestions uh, that Hariri approved of to replace Lahoud with, with people, with, with, with politicians who were really in Bashar's pocket. So uh, I don't think at the time Hariri was willing to go all the way uh, to, to defy Bashar Assad. I think Hariri was willing to offer uh, Bashar Assad what he offered his father Hafiz. Uh, those who lived in the 1990s uh, uh, or you know, who <coughs> remember that period of time would remember that uh, in so many periods, uh, uh, Rafi Hariri was called the foreign minister of Syria. He did the mopping up behind the, uh, the Assads and Hezbollah, whether financially or uh, regionally. Uh, whenever, uh, whenever there was war between Hezbollah and Israel, 
uh, Hariri was the first to go on CNN and try to stop it and to use all the connections that, that he had. When, uh, when uh, Amal and Hezbollah uh, rejected or they, they did not invite Gaddafi to the Beirut summit in 2002, I was there at the time reporting at the summit and I could see Rafi Hariri, he was doing all the rounds uh, to, make the Libyan, to, to, to make the Libyans accept because he, he thought at the time there were a few thousand Lebanese who were working in Libya. He didn't want these uh, 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 Lebanese expats to, to be kicked out of Libya. Uh, when when Lahoud didn't give the turn for Yasser Arafat to, to speak from Ramallah uh, and the Palestinians pulled out, of course, that was Syrian instructions. It was Hariri who went after the, the Palestinians. <coughs> so, of course, personalities matter. Hariri was, was a smart guy. I think that was, a, that was a big part of why he was killed, not only because he was a billionaire and he had connections, but he was really smart. He knew what he was doing. I think Hafiz was smart. And I think uh, a big part of the problem now is that Bashar does not measure up neither to his dad nor to his Hariri. And some say he, he was really jealous of Hariri, and that was part why he decided mm. to move against him. M Mike, actually, I'm going to ask you the same question again. I know it's a little, I know it's a little broad, but uh, if possible, if you could, if you could talk a little bit of the differences between, um, if you wanted to, uh, for instance, why don't we talk a little bit about your um, about your recent article in Mosaic, where you do make a distinction between how the Bush administration saw the region and how the Obama administration sees the region, which is very Iran centric. So I do. I, I, I am interested in getting a little bit the personalities who are driving the policy. So if you can, uh, yeah, draw a little finer lines on that. Well, um, I agree with what <clears throat> I agree with the distinction between um, uh, Assad the father and uh, and Assad the son. And Assad the son doesn't uh, uh, he he doesn't measure up. He has a much cruder vision. But also, but the world has also changed greatly, um, and the, the the order in Syria uh, has crumbled. It's not clear to me that it wouldn't have crumbled under um, under Assad the father as well because they're so they're that, socio that's actually interesting. They're, that they're, is kind of one of the things I wanted to get at. Like, is is it just personalities, or what are the different are there socioeconomic? We talk about sectarian clashes all the time. Are these things inevitable, regardless of who's running the show, or or what happens? I where I think we have to start. We the United States have to start though is with the big structural questions. That's what I was trying to put. My my emphasis on I don't disagree with 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 the word about uh, the difference between the father and the um, and the son, but there are just fundamental structural cleavages in the region, um, which I think our day to day political discourse uh, tends to tends to cover up and 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 ignore. I mean, um, we these days we are um, um, we are uh, on a day to day basis talking about. Um, Islamic extremism, um, ISIS, the rise of ISIS and, uh, and al-Qaeda, and presenting them as the greatest threat that we have to deal with. Um, I don't want to minimize that in the, in the least. Those are, um, those are very serious threats that every president should be, should be concerned about, and every president has to have um, a policy against it, but a, a policy to deal with it. But what happens is we begin to start conceptualizing the politics of the region in terms of um, in terms of religion and ideology and sectarianism uh, and so on, and I think we start to see the only threat from the Middle East to us is the um, is the is the Sunni uh, the Sunni extremist threat, and what has happened is real. I I actually believe that President Obama tends to see the region that way. He has prioritized. Um, um, first of all, he doesn't want to have much to do with the region if he can if he can avoid it. But then to the extent that he does, he has prioritized the fight against Sunni extremism as the number one, as the number one issue, which, as I tried to suggest, has just left the door open to the, to the Iranians. And it, I mean, if I take what, uh, what uh, Tony and Hussein have said, the, uh, there's, now a, there's now an Iranian system from Baghdad to Beirut. And it's the same, it's the same in each place. You've got the formal state structures and then right next to it, you have these these Iranian-dominated militias, which um, uh, which are the real power on the ground, um, and which can move the state this way or that way depending upon what the what what uh, what Iran what Tehran wants them um, wants them to do. We have either ignored this entirely, uh, or when people actually do pay, pay attention to it and they argue about it, they say, "Well, 
either what can we do about it or, you know, actually, these guys are going to be a good ally of ours against the, um, uh, against the Sunni extremists. All the people that argued 10 years ago, as Tony was saying, that um, actually, <coughs> uh, actually Hezbollah has gone through a process of Lebanonization, and it is now really much more a Lebanese political party than it is, um, than it is a tool of Iran. Um, and so, therefore, we don't have to worry about it. Well, now they're saying, wow, look, you know, Lebanon is playing a great role. In, uh, uh, Hezbollah is playing a great role in fighting Sunni extremism, so we don't have to do, uh, we don't have to do anything about it. Um, you know, this is fine as long as we're giving Iran what it wants. Um, the minute we turn around and disappoint Iran, then we're going to find out that those guns that, uh, that are mm -hmm. trained on Sunni extremists are going to be trained on our, our, our close allies and on, uh, and on us. Um, that has already dawned on our military. There was a great article in the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago um, uh, in which the uh, U.S. military commanders said, we can't cross Iranian red lines in Syria in terms of building up an opposition to Assad that could, that could also fight the Islamic State. We can't build up that opposition because if we cross the Iranian red lines, those Shiite militias that they have, uh, that they have trained um, and, and equipped in Iraq um, and, and in Syria, will turn their will turn their guns against us. That's American military commanders are saying that. Um, it, what bothers me is that it's taken um, it's taken a long time for this to dawn on uh, on our commanders. It's taking obviously an even longer time for it to become part of our political debate here. Um, it has to be part of our understanding of the the dilemma that we face in the Middle East. It's not just Sunni extremism. We have this rising Iranian power. Which is uh, which is managed to present itself as benign because of the Sunni threat, when it's actually, in my view, a much more serious threat because there is um, state power behind it, and soon, I think, a nuclear power behind it. Thanks. Uh, that's a that's a, a good uh, a, a transition point for you, Tony. If you'd like to pick pick that up. Um, well, I mean, one of the things, uh, sort of, to pick up on s some of the stuff that both Mike and Hussein said. Um, yes. Uh, there are structural issues at play, right? And so Hafez al-Assad was able to play a balancing game when the context lent itself to the ability to play a balancing game. But whenever that uh, ability to balance was constrained, the track record of the Syrian regime from the days of Hafez al-Assad to Bashar uh, is, does not diverge. I mean, they always, all, whenever they had to pick, they always picked the Iranians. Because they know. Syria, one of, that's one of the other interesting things also post-Hariri, is the so deflate... I just want to make clear, you yeah. mean picking Iran as opposed to the Arabs? As opposed or to the Arabs, or yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, when he was balancing between the Arabs and, and the Iranians. Another thing, like I was talking about the unmasking with Hezbollah, but one of the other things that became clear post-Hariri is the, uh, the exposure of, uh, uh, of the mythology of... Syria's centrality as a major player and so on and so forth, right? It's a, it's always was a second or third tier player in re, in respect to the to the to the broader power powers in the region, and that's why he played both father and son played a uh, a uh, balancing game because they had they didn't have any other ability but to be the, because that, because they don't have the state doesn't have the 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 uh, ability to to project power beyond that. So they had terrorism, that's the only way they could do it, and they had, they had Iran. And whenever they needed it, they would always rely on Iran. And, and that's why in Lebanon, when they went out, they had to rely on Iran. Um, uh, in 1982, when the Israelis pushed them Sorry, out. Sorry, whoever that is, please just pick it up, walk out of the room, answer the phone, and take care of it. Okay. Uh, that may, maybe that's a good time for everyone to turn off your phone now, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, Tony, thanks. No problem. So, so that, so that, like I said, when, when the context, the regional context allowed, when the st structural elements allowed for balance, he was able to balance. Otherwise, it was an illusion. Another illusion also was, I mean, I, you know, if we were going to assess also the Rafi Hariri, uh, 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 era, um, the mopping up that Hussein talked about, right? That also was an illusion because he figured uh, that he could.
play that balance between uh, having that tiger that he couldn't control, be it either the Syrians, his overlords at the time, or or Hezbollah, right in his uh, in in Lebanon, and uh, pumping a lot of money in 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 the hope that somehow Lebanon can be revived once there's a peace agreement. So he banked everything on that possibility uh, in the 1990s during the peace process and so on. But it was during the 1990s that you saw uh, one of the main f failures of uh, of the uh, sort of the Hariri attempt to sort of have it both ways in Lebanon. I mean, he was he he didn't have power, so I'm not I'm not blaming him. He was trying to do the best he could. Was in 1996 with the um, the war that uh, Hussein mentioned between Hezbollah and, and Israel, um, which resulted in an, in an agreement that settled the rules of engagement between Lebanon and, and Israel, uh, what's called the April Understanding of 1996, um, in which Hezbollah and Israel agreed with American, French, and Syrian patronage that uh, uh, so um, Israel would not target civilian um, uh, areas in Lebanon and uh, and as long as Hezbollah targets only, um, doesn't launch its operations from civilian, uh, uh, you know, from civilian holdouts. Now, what, what that means is they can go out, launch, and then come back and hide in the civilian areas, and then they cannot be touched. So that, those rules of engagement, which became sort of like a tit-for-tat between Hezbollah and Israel, for, lasted for 10 years until the 2006 wars. It allowed Hezbollah to grow in stature and build its mythology as an equal to Israel because it was never, it was, ne it was treated with kids' gloves, essentially. That's one of the other things that collapsed after Hariri died, right after Hariri died. 2006, Hezbollah tried, when, he, when they launched the war in 2006, tried, Nasrallah rather, tried to, to tell the state, now you have to go behave like Rafi Hariri used to do, mop up after us. We started this war, go mop it up. Uh, the Israelis at the time said, all right, that's, that's over now. Now you launch, now we have the so-called Dahi doctrine. We flatten out Lebanon, wherever it is, right? Now that has bought... Did that, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just a question. Did that have anything to do with the death of, I mean... Well, the, the Israelis war, were, were less willing to what? No, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that the Israelis... You know, uh, like dealing with... The although it's interesting, it's interesting whether, you know, let's say the Saudis decided that we're not going to necessarily go and rush and uh, uh, put diplomatic uh, pressure on our allies to, in turn, pressure the Israelis to stop. Uh, maybe Hariri, had he been alive, may have been able to prevail on them yeah. to do so. Um, either way, it, it was actually it worked out. It, it worked out better because it sort of eliminated those really dreadful rules of engagement that existed for ten years. Um, so that's one of the other things, you know, how after he died, there's a lot of changes. And that then in turn impacted the ability of Bashar al-Assad to continue to play the, the game that his father, he was just I incapable of doing it because of these various structural elements. Thanks. Uh, Mike, you were going to follow up with, a, with something to say, or not follow up, but you were going to say something if you wanted to. Uh, I just quickly wanted to make a, make a point off of something that Tony said, and that's um, that there are these there are these differences between um, Tehran and Syria, uh, between Iran and Syria, um, and between Syria and Hezbollah to be sure, um, but they're never as great as people make them out to be. Uh, I mean, the, the the point being that there is this structural divide in the region between the Iranian alliance system, which is now Iran, Iraq, um, um, uh, Syria, Hezbollah, um, and every and and everybody else. There are divisions on either side of the divide, but that is the, the, the fundamental gap. So a lot of, there's a lot of nonsense being talked about these days. The president said, um, you know, that uh, or, or the, the, pre the White House is saying um, with respect to the future of Syria, Assad can't be part of the future of Syria. There has to be a political process by which Assad will step aside. Um, and then the friends of the White House and the press are saying, Yes, just like what happened in Iraq. What happened in Iraq? We had Maliki. Maliki was a problematic sectarian actor, and we got rid of uh, uh, and we got rid of him and substituted a body for him. Uh, and we did that. Who do we do that? We did that together with the Iranians. The Iranians helped us with that, and now we have a much more inclusive government in in, in Baghdad. You could put you, you could put a beanie uh, a beanie baby or a uh, 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 a uh, you know a a a, uh, a teddy bear uh, a stuffed animal whatever you want in um, in the role of the prime minister in in Iraq. What matters 
are the security services, and the security sector in Iraq is now totally under the thumb of the Iranians. They don't care who the figure is, figurehead is, as long as they have the uh, as long as they have the the security sector. Um, in 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 Syria, it's not the same thing, but w uh, um, that is not that scenario is never going to take place. It allows the president to say, oh yeah. Somewhere in the future, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, we're going to move that guy out and, oh, guy, we're going to do it together with the Iranians, too. They're going to, they're going to help us and so on. It's all pie in the so sky. They were just, like, to they were just t like, totally chumming for the Americans, just throwing them stuff. And, like, here, this will make the Americans happy, right. whatever they can. Exactly. Uh, exactly. They, can they, sell, got, they, can they got their vital, the right. got their vital interests. They got their vital interests. If they ever cooperate with us on Syria... It's going to be because they, like in Iraq, they have sewed up the security system, and we're, they're going to be giving us nothing but a but a uh, but window dressing. Um, a question, actually, I'm going to ask. Start with you, Hussein, if I may. Like, look, a lot of people talk about how the uh, the earliest, or we started to see different. We started to see different uh, fissures in the region with the Iraq, especially sectarian, with the you know with the U.S. occupation, U.S.-led occupation of Iraq. The war they're starting in 2003, the different sectarian fights. What are the different things that we should have or could have seen in Lebanon between March 8th and March 14th? Is it the same thing, or were there, is it strictly sectarian, or were there different elements that, uh, or different seeds that have grown now to what we have in the region? I mean, do you have a. No, I, 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 I agree with Mike when he said uh, uh, we didn't have a, a Lebanon policy. I think we had a. Uh, Lebanon policy for a short time, maybe between 05 and 08, but that was it. And um, I think at the at the first test, this Lebanon policy fell apart because it wasn't uh, the Obama administration yet who uh, uh, urged March 14 to get into the Doha deal for the March 8. It was Condi Rice who did right. that. So uh, I think uh, the United States has always been willing to. Uh, uh, just bail on the Lebanese allies. I mean, I mean, you know, granted, Lebanon is a small fish in the big pond, but uh, I, I think uh, the the in, in all fairness, the March 14 never got a strong hand, neither domestically nor internationally, compared to March 8. I mean, it, if if you're hedging, then your best bet is is March 8. Well, uh, this this is kind of what I mean about uh, right. I mean, with Iraq, we can look and see the sectarian fights, but if we're one of the things that we might look back and see from Lebanon is the Iranians gave March 8th, the Iranians stood behind March 8th, right? And so who was standing behind March 14th in the same, um, is, is that what you're talking about? Yes, or? Okay. yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, if, if, if the U.S. And, and the Gulf had stood behind March 14th in the same uh, way Iran stood behind uh, Hezbollah and its allies, I think there, there would have been some sort of parity. Now, mind you, the Shia of Lebanon are only one third, uh, and there's no way Hezbollah, no, no matter how powerful it can get, there's no way it can just control the whole country without some sort of assistance. And the assistance, the assistance it gets that it can buy uh, from other sects, that's, that's mostly funded by Iran. And w w which is really uh, absurd because the other, the other side should not be short on funding. <laughs> you know, Hariri the Sun spent the years after um, 06 or 07 w without cash. You know, I mean, and no one talks about these things. But, you know, his institutions in Beirut, his TV, he, he wasn't paying his TV employees money. And these errors never happen on the other side. I mean, if this is a regional fight, then these right. sort of mistakes should not happen. So, I mean, much, you know, whatever March 14 did. And I think the first person to see that was Wali Jumblat, uh, uh -huh. the Druze leader, who I think is probably the smartest of, of the leaders in Lebanon and the region. I mean, he knows that he commands a small minority that has some sort of muscle, but not enough to go into uh, long uh, uh, conflicts. And, and he saw what, it, you know, uh, he saw what was happening. And um, I think in, in May of 08, when Hezbollah swept the region, like Tony said, uh, I think Hariri was trying to convince Jumblat uh, to hold his ground in the mountain because the Americans are coming. And, um, and the famous quote that uh, Jumblat uh, said, are you crazy? We'll be swimming to the American ships in the sea. So, so Jumblat saw it that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, the U.S. wanted a compromise with Hezbollah. Um, so in, in, in all fairness, you know, even if March 14 was a, 
was a, a cross sectarian. It had it had uh, uh, Christians, it had Sunnis, it had it had very few Shia. Now, granted, March 14 never became a totally uh, non-sectarian Lebanese coalition. You know, if, inside March 14, you had to be identified as being either Christian or Sunni or Shia. But you know, unfortunately, there was no uh, heavy Shia presence. Mm. So uh, the sectarianism in Lebanon is a bit different than the sectarianism in Iraq because over there you have three really huge blocks, the Shia and the Sunni and the Kurds. In Lebanon, it's more nuanced, and, and these people are you know, more used to uh, uh, just changing uh, alliances all the time. You know, between five players, you, you get two and three or you know, all, all sorts of combination. In, in, uh, uh, in Iraq, you have the, the Sunnis have been beating the Shia and the Kurds all the time, and all of a sudden, the Shia got an American hand to be the ones who beat everybody else. Tony, did, did you want to... Um, well, um, actually, he just added a third point, but we can come back <laughs> to that later. Um, uh, but two points that, that Hussein made uh, are actually worth uh, sort of amplifying a little bit. Um, first of all, this false par uh, equivalence that is um, often done here in, in when talking about the sectarian civil war, and everybody does it, and you know, starting with policymakers to opinion makers, you know, whereby you put Saudi Arabia as the representative of the Sunni side, sowing sectarian, you know, warfare in the region, and then you have the Iranians, you know, and then you say, well, which is better, you know, and blah and so on. What? Hussein just emphasized is that there is no such parity. The, the Saudis do not have the structures, the state structures, to be able to conduct this kind of foreign policy that's often assigned to them. I mean, one sometimes would, might even wish that they did, but they don't. Uh, the Quds Force, okay, is an institution, and has the creation of Hezbollah is simultaneous with the success of the I Islamic Revolution in Iran. It's simultaneous, it's organic, because they, the minute the Islamic Revolution succeeds, you need to have the state apparatus in order to be able to conduct both domestic policy on the one hand until the, the revolutionary elite consolidated power, and then, and then expand, uh, extend that to foreign policy. Um, you have a state apparatus from the birth of the, of the new regime in Iran uh, that, that has been dedicated to this. Okay, over 30 years, this is what they do. That's what the state does. To kind of play these kind of equivalencies between Qatar, Turkey, or Saudi Arabia is, is, is absurd. It does not exist. Uh, that's, that's the first point. The second point regarding um, how do you make policy toward Lebanon? That's a very interesting thing, right? And goes back to the Hariri era as well. And to how does the United States or Israel or anybody actually look at Lebanon and formulate policy on what basis? For the longest time, the basis was Syria and the peace process, both of which were entirely illusory uh, pillars to build a policy on. Um, in the meantime, the Iranians were building a structure over 30 some years that now kind of, and actually kind of appears in full force in 2006, uh, when we really see the extent of their control and the f infrastructure that they had built and the ambition that they had and so on. Um, so when the United States, when Condi Rice or whatever were devising policy uh, in 2007, it was with Annapolis in mind, the, the sort of the peace process. It was a peace process basis for, for the policy. Completely illusory. Or Syria, or how do we kind of get Bashar al-Assad? Who cares about Bashar al-Assad in Syria? Now we see that, right? Ten years after, you see, who cares about Bashar al-Assad? It's the Iranians who are running Bashar al-Assad. It was the Iranians back then as well. So, it so if you want to do a policy on Lebanon now, it's an, Ira it's an Iran-based policy. You're pushing back against, against uh, the Iranians. Um, and I think, I'm, I think the, the Israelis, you know, first of all, spotted this is, it. And, this is good. Yeah. This is one thing. Can, actually, Hussein yeah. wanted to say something, but I wanted to come back to that sure. in a second because th this is a, a kind of a bigger issue. So yeah, uh, that'll a, be a, good. A yeah, quick Hussein. intervention. Actually, I, I totally agree with Tony. And I have this uh, hypothetical question in mind. Okay. If uh, um, the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, uh, says tomorrow, okay, you know what? No more negotiations. We're going toward the, the bomb. We're producing a bomb. And there's this open conflict between the United States on one side and Iran on the other side. Now, other than the B-52s that we can fly over Iran, who is going to fight the war against the Iranians, against the Iranian militias? Walid Jumblat is not coming back. 
the Sunni uh, Iraqi tribes are not coming back, you know, who will fight the Iranians? Uh, who, who will be America's allies to fight the Iranians? ISIS? So I, I totally agree with Tony. You know, that we just <laughs> threw our allies one after, the, uh, one after the other under the bus, and now the only hope that we have are negotiations. Well, let, let me... Um, I think you're right, and I think... Well, this is what I wanted to come back to with Tony. I mean, there, there is, especially we've seen this over the last few weeks. Tony wrote about this um, today, and I'll, I, I wrote about it as well. But there is a strategic divergence between U.S. and Israeli views regarding, regarding the Levant, regarding Syria, regarding Lebanon. So I want, I want to ask you about this, Tony, but then I want to come back to you, Mike, and also talk about if Lebanon policy is going to be uh, – Iran-centric and Iran-based policy, then ha how does that divide us from allies in the region? So I guess I would say, I mean, first of all, Israel, and then I would look mm -hmm. at some of the look at some of the Arabs. So Tony, if you want to start that off, I, th I think Israel is really when we're talking. When I said that the the Saudis and all of these other uh, Sunni allies don't have the capacity to be so when when the when the president of the United States talks about an equilibrium in the region between the Sunnis and the Shia. It's it's a it's a it's a fallacy. Okay, there is no there is no equilibrium. So when you're actually talking, and Lee, you've written about this uh, as well, is, uh, that when when you are talking about equilibrium, you're really talking about the Israelis, right? So it's Iran and Israel, uh, and and th and that's certainly how the Iranians view it. I mean, I don't think they're all too particularly worried about the United Arab Emirates, let's say, standing in their way or Kuwait or whatever. Um, so uh, when so. It, if it is Israel, then you, if you're the Iranians, you want to make sure that you're going to, first of all, press your advantage that you have with the Americans now. And if, and if the president of the United States is saying, yes, I am all for equilibrium, let us balance out uh, Iran and whoever its adversaries uh, may be in the region. Um, by definition, then, that becomes uh, that the United States will have to side with Iran. If the preponderance of force is perceived to be on the side of the Israelis, then we're going to have to sort of take them down a notch and so on. And that's why it was a really interesting thing to see this January 18th uh, episode that you mentioned when uh, the Israelis took out this convoy in, in the Golan that was setting up an infrastructure in the Golan. Uh, there's not been a peep from the administration about how this is unacceptable, that the United States is going to draw a line in the sand here and say, if the Iranians set up something here, we are going to come and we have Israel's back, paraphrase the president, uh, and we are going to, to, the, you know, to, to, to put our foot down. No, because if you have already conceded Israel as a, uh, uh, Syria as a sphere of influence for the Iranians, uh, that's kind of the, the natural progression. So the Israelis now, it's starting to dawn on them. There were two pieces that I referenced in my, in my uh, article today, um, uh, one by Itamar Rabinovich, one of the, the, the top Syria a uh, man in, in, in Israel, and Ephraim Imbar. And both of them, although coming from very different places, reach the same conclusion. Well, if we're going to deter the Iranians in the Golan, uh, we're going to have to take out Assad. There's going to have to be a shift. Now, interestingly, it was Imbar who came out with the, with the phrase that now Syria becomes a uh, an issue of strategic divergence between us and Washington. Why? The wa because Washington has... Uh, Mike talked about the red line. We don't cross Iranian red lines in, in Syria. So... If we don't cross Iranian red lines in Syria, there's no way the Obama administration is going to support Israel, let's say, in, in striking at Assad in a matter, uh, to quote Rabinovich, that would um, impact the course of the civil war, not just a strike, a punitive strike, in a matter that would shift the balance of power on the ground uh, to the disadvantage of, of, of Assad. Um, so it, that's, that becomes the sort of the, the fault line. The fault line is the United States now is, protect, is extending a protective umbrella by, by respecting Iranian red lines and spheres of influence in Syria, is taking its protective umbrella from Israel and extending it to Iranian assets in Syria. And now the Israelis, if they're going to go after Iranian assets, they're going to have to do so against the will of the United States. If I, if I could just um, follow your reasoning to its natural conclusion. If Zarif says to Kerry... Yes. <laughs> if those Israeli SOBs do anything against Assad, the nuclear deal is off. Yes. What's the United States going to do? Is it going to call up Israel and say, you know what, I want to put more pressure on Iran, so go ahead, go after Assad? Or is it going to call up Netanyahu and say, don't you dare mess up my nuclear deal? And that's, we saw that, by the way. We saw that with the leaks that came out, uh, that uh, af after the Kunaitra incident, the strike in Kunaitra, 
that the Iranians deliberately leaked, that we told the Americans to go and tell the Israelis that we're going to respond. So they are making it known that they're talking to the administration to put a leash on Israel, exactly in the, in the manner that you've described. Uh, Hussein, would you like Just, to... Just uh, yeah. to be fair... Uh, I no, think, don't uh, be fair. No, 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 no. Who are you going to be fair to? This is not the place for that. No, no to, to be we're, fair to the administration. No, we're. Uh, they, 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 no, no, they, <laughs> they didn't say anything about uh, uh, Konaitra uh, airstrike. They didn't say anything about the. Egyptian airstrike in Libya. <laughs> yeah. They didn't say anything about any airstrike yeah, anywhere. Right. So they're just not saying stuff. So I, uh, <laughs> look, is there a is there a problem? And Lebanon is a place where. Like Lebanon right now is a place where, or Beirut anyway, it seems to be there's a, there is some sort of agreement, right, that Beirut is not going to be touched right now in right. a larger regional conflagration. Right. So how much longer does that last? Hussein, I'll start with you. How much longer, like, or what will, I mean, there's lots of different things that could tip the balance, but if you could describe the mechanism right now, like keeping the balance of power there, keeping some sort of sense of security, and what would tip it? Um, well, I think, um, you know, whatever they're doing now, even though it might not be in the interest of uh, the people who are against Hezbollah, but whatever they're doing now is, uh, is good enough because, you know, uh, there's uh, some sort of peace that's holding up. It's not ideal, but I, th I think this is the only way they can get it. And it, this is probably a, a byproduct of, of Iranian-American uh, uh, talks. Uh, now, what we know uh, from inside Hezbollah is that uh, Hezbollah was was not really keen uh, on getting involved in Syria, but then it, you know, like Tony said, they get the orders and they march. So uh, they had to go into Syria, and by doing that, they dragged Lebanon with them, and and then they had to uh, to uh, to face the backlash inside their own home base, which they really don't want to do. So I think uh, as a byproduct. Uh, the exchange of the continuous exchange of emails between uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, I think they said, okay, let's keep Lebanon out of this. The Saudis agreed, the Iranians said, why not? And the formula that we have now is that uh, uh, the Sunnis were given the Ministry of the Interior and uh, whatever non Shia or non Hezbollah uh, actor that might be, uh, that might be doing uh, things to hurt this peace, the Sunnis themselves take care of them. And, and the Shia are not going after uh, non-Shia. So I think they have this sort of arrangement wherein everyone uh, handles their own uh, troublemakers, so to speak. Uh, and uh, they have this arrangement of, of, of that wherein Hezbollah can just go and fight inside, inside Syria without anyone. Obj I mean, they're objecting, but there's nothing officially they can do. And, and you know what? I mean, if, if you are Hariri or if you are Jaja or, you know, anyone who's, who's not with Hezbollah inside of Lebanon, I think you should be happy that Hezbollah is sending its uh, forces inside Syria, you know, because uh, you know, they're doing the thing that's not really in the interest of the Shia of Lebanon or the power of Hezbollah. Uh, what breaks this? I'm not sure. But, you know, any one of the two parties, the Sunnis or the Shia, if they walk back this uh, uh, agreement that we have, uh, it'll, it'll break. I, I don't see anyone breaking it. Uh, I think uh, the worst part is that this formula has completely replaced the state. There's no need for oh, a president. Uh, There's no need for a right. prime minister who's just there, you know, hanging out. The speaker is, you know, is also uh, some sort of decor. So what we have now is what Tony was saying. Uh, this is the Iranian era. We've completely uh, replaced the states and all states, the state of, of, of Iraq, the government that uh, Mike talked about, the the stuffed animal mm. prime minister. <laughs> We've replaced yes. them with militias, you know. In Lebanon, we have a, an, another uh, uh, a fluffy, dovey, stuffed, uh, stuffed, uh, uh, you know, animal mm. prime minister. And and the ones who call the shots are the militias. And you know that's how it's working in Lebanon. Right. Uh, Tony, what breaks the accommodation? Or what? Look, in a larger way, not just what. Two different questions. What would break the accommodation in Lebanon, and what would break the Iranian? Maybe I'll save this for Mike, but what would break the Iranian model, the Iranian pattern, which they now boast controls four Arab capitals? So let me, let me start off with you on the first one, and you can answer the second one too. Look, uh, there are two elephants in the room, right, in, in Lebanon now. Uh, in fact, there's 
about 1.5 million Sunni uh, elephants, right? I mean, there's 1.5 million Sunni Syrian refugees in the country right now. Uh, and uh, there is no, there was no sort of Sunni military action in the country because the United States decided that it's going to help Hezbollah snuff it out. Uh, the Saudis decided that, look, it's just not worth it. We don't have a game to play anyway. We don't have the assets to play. If, we, if, if this happens, uh, God knows what will happen to the power of our m moderate Sunni guys, the Hariris and so on and so forth. You will have a whole bunch of uh, more militant Sunnis uh, being able to rise and then appeal to the power of the street and, and, and sort of uh, outflank Hariri in, in, in sort of claiming the mantle of leadership. So they work now, and now that's everybody now, everybody's, you know, favorite pet, the LAF, you know, and everybody wants to enhance the mythology of the LAF as this national institution. But that was the third point that uh, Hussein was talking about, about how people in Iraq, you know, you have one sect beating up the other sect. That's exactly what the LAF is now, okay? The LAF used to be in the 80s a Maronite institution that would beat up in the you know, 70s and 80s that would beat up others, and then it split when it couldn't. And now it's a, it's an it's a it's a tool that the Shia control, that specifically Hezbollah control, and they uh, wantonly uh, slap the Sunnis around, and that's it. And Hariri has to say, yes, it's a national institution, and uh, it's fantastic, and I'm with the state. Because what else is he going to do? He can build a militia? He can't build a militia. He can't do anything of that nature. So what you have then is this, this. So two things you have. On the one hand, that system where you know, either it breaks, either it reaches a point where the Sunnis say, okay, no, or the, or the Syrian refugees, let's say, um, that, that pull that's coming from the Beka fuses somehow and then revives a, 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 some sort of a militant, explodes into a militant option. I don't see that happening immediately, but it's a possibility down the road. That's the first thing. The second thing is obviously the Israelis. I mean, and we came very close to it this, uh, this past January. Uh, Hezbollah launches an attack um, in, um, from Shaba. Uh, the Israelis have, and they're not, every, even people like Rabinovich, I mean, certainly no hawk or, you know, right wing, uh, uh, you know, a commentator, says, uh, look, this wasn't necessarily conducive to Israeli deterrence, what we did in, uh, in how we responded to the Shabbat thing uh, in ja in ja after January 28th. Because it kind of revived the tit-for-tat rules that I mentioned earlier, the April understanding. If Hezbollah thinks that somehow, well, look, the Israelis are actually deterred. They don't want really a war in Lebanon. It's going to be too, it's too messy. A lot of rockets are going to be falling on Tel Aviv and other areas in, in, in Israel. They don't really want that. So they will just kind of figure out another way to respond. And that's what they're banking on with the Golan front as well, that they can somehow do that without really paying a big price. The question is, well, what if the Israelis decide, no, <laughs> actually, this is, uh, uh, the Iranians are about to break out into a nuclear power. It's just impossible for us to sit and watch this uh, expeditionary force of the IRGC or a sort of foreign legion uh, on our border uh, operating now with a nuclear umbrella. So there is, there is right now this, this ability that, you know, Lebanon's st stability and so on, as with before, as at the time of Hariri in the 90s, it's, it's illusory. At some point, um, something is going to snap. Uh, now, it may take a while before that happens. Let, let me ask something. I'm going to come back around, and this is how we'll, we will probably end the, uh, this part of the, uh, the panel on that, and I'll open up for some questions. But if the Iranian order, the Iranian-backed order is that fragile in Lebanon, is it that fragile around the rest of the region as well? I'm going to start with Mike. Is that fragile around the rest of the region, and what, uh, what, um, what do you need to break it? I wouldn't call it fragile. I'd call it vulnerable, but not, but not fragile. I, I just want to say because like a lot of the times, you know, we, we talk, we have, we talk, we take different sides, right? First we talk about Qasem Soleimani saying we control four Arab capitals and now we're exporting the revolution. And then the other side, it, it does. It seems vulnerable and fragile in ways. So I just want to make that. I, 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 uh, I just think they've come up with a very winning formula. Um, as described by, uh, as described by uh, by Tony, 
And um, if you look at what the IRGC is or what the, what the Quds Force is, if, and if you kind of map it against U.S. institutions, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix of a propaganda organization, a covert intelligence organization, a special operations, uh, a special operations force, and USAID. I mean, it, it, has, it, has, it, has, it has money to distribute, it has special operations capability, and so on, and also an intelligence capability. So they go in, and they, they actually understand the landscape in a way that we don't. We, we started to get this kind of understanding of the Middle East during the surge in, in, mm. in Iraq. Um, and when we started separating the tribes from, uh, from, uh, from al-Qaeda, um, and, and I think we had a knowledge, for, you know, 2000, 2007, 8, 9, we had a knowledge on the ground of what the landscape was in Iraq. We understood who were the good guys, who were the bad guys, which, which sheikhs you needed to bring on board in order to get the, uh, in, in order to develop uh, the, to shift the balance of power on the ground um, and so forth. And now you'd have to, what, what we would have to do, that's what the Iranians do region wide. And with a fraction of our budget, and, oh, and also their willingness to use violence. Mm -hmm. So like, if, you're the, if you're the Iraqi, if, if, it doesn't matter how much money the United States has given you. If you're the Iraqi prime minister and you know that if you do something the Americans don't like, well, what's going to happen? Maybe they'll withhold money. Maybe the president will call you up and say nasty things to you, right? If you do something the Iranians don't like, they're going to kick you in the groin. They're gonna they're gonna go after your family members, and they're gonna uh, and they're gonna uh, they're gonna go after your support base. And you know that you know that for a fact that the uh, that the that the pain is coming. So who are you gonna you know who who are you gonna propitiate? You're gonna propitiate the Iranians and not the Americans. As as Hussein said, any Lebanese who who values his own life when it comes to hedging is gonna hedge in favor of March 8th and 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 and, and not March 14th because they know the Americans are not. Um, are not there. So if we tried, if, if we examined this thing, the Iranian system, and we looked at it for what it is, and we developed a strategy designed to go after its weak points, Iran is, a, is an impoverished third world country, right? They're just smarter than we are in the Middle East, and they have, they're more focused because they understand exactly what their vital interests are. We are always confused. It's an awesome thing when the United States clearly defines what, it na what its national interest is, puts somebody in charge and puts resources behind it, it's an awesome power. Can you give an but example? It, sure, I mean, the surge, the okay. surge, right? When we, the, what we, what we the, just the special operations capability that we developed and went after al-Qaeda in, in al-Anbar, right? That was an awesome, that was an awesome capability. But we, we our attention, we, it, it, unfortunately, it's, it's structural and it's deep in our, our whole way of doing um, our, our whole uh, way of life and way of government. It's hard for us to sustain this over the, um, over the long term. Just, just a quick follow-up. I mean, uh, so just imagine in 2013 when you had all these, the beginnings of all these car bombs in Beirut, right, against, in retaliation to Hezbollah's interference in, in Syria. When the Iranian embassy blows up, you know, or an attempt at the Iranian embassy to blow up. Uh, uh, well, that's what the United States said, right? He said, oh, no, 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 no. And we gave the intelligence. We passed on the intelligence to, to apprehend the people who were possibly uh, behind this, right? So, well, what if we didn't do that? So that's what I'm saying. So like when you say, what, what will tip it, right? No. Suppose, suppose we don't do that. We don't uh, what? We don't, we don't give the help. Iranian, help the Iranians? Yeah. Right? We say to the LAF, We don't you know, play honest broker. That's right. The clerical that's regime. right. We don't so manage it. You know? what, what if we, if we said... And, um, I'm just following your logic. If if we said, look, every every National Security Council, every 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 principal of the National Security Council has recommended to the president that he build up the Syrian opposition against Assad, and the president has said no, 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 no. In my view, thank you for for mentioning my Iran article, <laughs> Mosaic uh, Obama's secret Iran strategy at Mosaic <laughs> magazine. Uh, the in my view the president has been said no 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 because of uh, because of Iran but whatever his motives he hasn't he hasn't done it if we built up that opposition and if the if the president um, said I think it's a, a vital U S national interest that there be a uh, a stable successor regime to Assad in uh, in uh, in Damascus 
and I think that Hezbollah is supporting Assad and is carrying out a nefarious role and is acting contrary to the interests of the United States, and I authorize the U.S. military, I, and I, I insist, I demand that, that Hezbollah go home, uh, and I authorize the U.S. military to help Hezbollah go home. <laughs> that could change the, the that w we could change the balance very, very I, quickly. I just want to get clear. So you're advocating violent measures against the Iranian-backed order of the Middle East. I just want to. I'm I'm wanna... I'm arguing only one thing. We have okay. to have a paradigm shift. <laughs> All right. Right. A paradigm I mean, shift, and we have to it, see the map differently. What what we what we do to follow on after that? It doesn't matter to me as much as there be a paradigm the, shift. I mean, these guys are fighting in the Kalamun hills uh, on the e sort of the eastern border of, of, of Lebanon, the northeastern border. Um, they've been fighting these guys for two years now. Um, uh, we're talking hundreds of ragtag uh, elements. Now you'll hear ISIS this and Nusra. Pharmacists and, and, and yes, yeah, carpenters. He, exactly. These guys are, uh, and he, de he declared, Nasrallah declared victory in the Kalamun now like what, seven times already? And it's, it's just not going away. And it's there. Now just imagine a little bit of capability, let's say, what kind of pressure that did. Instead, we did the other thing under the cover of the LAF. The LAF now is running operations against Syrian rebels in the Kalamun with US weapons. Why? Why? For what purpose? And now imagine they come up also from the Kunaitra area, from the southeast as well. Uh, and this is maybe, that's what Hezbollah is worried that the Israelis are going to do. I'm not saying that they will, but that's what they're, that's what they're freaking out about. What if, what if Israel facilitates movement towards the Shaba area from the Kunaitra, let's say, and then you have the, the Kalamun Hill from the northeast. It, they could be in serious troubles. The question is, yeah, will there be a paradigm shift? I just yes. want to ask Hussein very quickly, because I, I, I do want to open it up uh, in a second. Hussein, so is the Iranian backed order of the region, is it, is it fragile? What does it take to... Well, yeah, snap it or, or look, or is the balance of power that the administration wants to create, is this a good thing? Uh, well, I think, you know, it's, uh, uh, we should look at Iran as a power that's uh, not invincible. You know, uh, the Shia have a majority in, uh, in Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Bahrain, and Azerbaijan, but that's about it. And, um, you know, going after Syria, trying to have two million Alawites and one million uh, Lebanese Shia control uh, over 16 million Sunnis in, uh, in Syria and one million uh, Sunnis uh, in, in Lebanon. I think that's a far-fetched project. And, and I'm not sure the Iranians have thought this through, but you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing. Uh, now, you know, I, I agree with what the, what the guys have been saying. That this administration is, is so bad that if you shut down the National Security Council, which is calling the shots in that State Department, you'd get a policy that's more in favor of the interests of the United States than what than the one that we have now. They're so bad, even in statements, you know, they can't decide which side they're on everywhere, whether in Egypt, in Iran, or, or in, in Saudi Arabia. And what we have now is that the Iranians understand this and they think this is a, a, a great moment for them to, to, to achieve whatever they want to achieve. Um, and, 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 you know, like Mike said, uh, I think the surge was a was a brilliant model that uh, uh, could be repeated and copied, and and that would probably be deterrence with Iran, and that probably make the Iranians in, think in of, Syria, okay. for instance, in would Syria, it be with in, in Syria, Syria, in Lebanon, and and mm. you know everywhere. It's it's just you know there are tribes in all these countries, mm. and you can replicate the model everywhere, and and then you can you can have deterrence with the Iranians, and the whole point, you know, this, the whole. The whole idea of the Barack Obama foreign policy with Iran has been a, a big uh, a carrot and a big stick. And now it's, there's, there's no stick anymore. It's just like one year from nuclear weapon. Or That's, six months. Or, or six <laughs> months, or whatever it is. So yeah, I agree. You know, I think uh, our best bet is just to uh, wait out until a, a, a smarter administration is in place. Um. Firas, I think that you, did you want to ask a question before? Did, question if, if, if you do, if you can just wait, uh, that your question got asked and answered. Yeah, but I mean. Oh, hold, hold on, let, let, let's just bring a mic up here. And if you could identify yourself when you make it a chance. Firas Mokhtad, Global Policy Advisors in the University of Maryland. Guys, it never gets old listening to you. There's always something insightful to, to hear and, and to That's learn from. That's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> but, um,
th that question, <laughs> yeah, no. th that we all agree that the administration has done quite a terrible job in the region in the past couple of years. But the question to my mind from a policy perspective is, is what options are available at this point. And the reality is that uh, those who we tend to favor in the region uh, are allies, whether it be in the GCC or some of the, uh, in Lebanon specifically, March 14th and, and, and uh, Saad Hariri, are not the, the fighting type. They're, they're not the folks that you could really go do battle with against Iran and its forces. So then we're really left with one option to my mind, which is to use direct US military force, all of we know politically is not really viable in Washington these days. Perhaps you know working the channel of the intel community, the CIA, you know has long-standing experience in, in the Middle East, and you know in, in, in Lebanon in specific, in '83 I think our, the largest CIA CIA station was in Lebanon. Of course, Hezbollah in Iran took that out, and in '84 they took out William Buckley, the CIA ch station chief. But is the surge that the model is working the intelligence angle? The model is building the um, the Syrian uh, FSA type the train and equip program. The model, or is it even too late for that? Because aside from that, I really don't yeah. see much of what <laughs> the policy tools okay. are. Mike, why don't you start with that? Um, uh, I, there's no, um, as I said at the beginning, that there's only there's only two choices. There's there's working um, there's working with Iran uh, to, to develop a condominium with Iran, or working against against Iran. Um, and in my in my mind, there's only one choice, Thanks. which is to work against Iran. Um, you can, so, so you have to make the choice. And that each one of them, as I, I referenced this piece by Martin Indyk, he said, you know, each one of these choices has terrible downsides. And it, it's true. There are terrible downsides. Our, our allies are not what, they, what we would want them to be. They're divided among themselves. Um, they don't have a lot of the tools we'd want them to have and, and, and so on. But that's what we've, that's what we've got. So the, the first step, I think, is to put together the coalition to contain Iran uh, in, in, in the region. Um, and the second thing is to start uh, is to start developing the the forces on the ground that could take care of the um, th that could that could fight. And that uh, I'm not saying American forces, but Lee wanted me to, in, to 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 call for another George W. Bush style invasion of. <laughs> no. But but we uh, <laughs> but uh, which I which I which I'm not advocating. Yes, I'm not advocating. I slipped you that note. Which I'm not which I'm not advocating. Uh, which I'm which I'm not advocating at all. But I, I don't think, uh, first of all, if the United States, if, if the president had the paradigm shift, he's not going to, but if he had the paradigm shift, and then secondly, he put together the coalition. If he, if he followed through on what he says his policy is in Syria, which is to build up the opposition, right? We've had a train and equip program approved uh, with the Syrian opposition for two years now, and it hasn't done anything. If he actually, if he actually carried through with a policy that's, that's been approved, they would feel it in Tehran. They feel it in they, they, Hezbollah. Would feel it immediately. And as as Tony says, there are there are pressure points, mm -hmm. ser very serious pressure points for Lebanon in Syria. If we developed a, a, a special a, a Syrian opposition special operations capability, provided it with intelligence, logistics, and started putting um, putting soldiers on targets in um, in, in Syria that were dangerous for Hezbollah, they would feel it immediately. I, we're, we are a great power. We, we may not feel like it, and we like to tell ourselves we're weak all the time, but we're a hell of a lot stronger than Iran if we put our mind to it. Well, I'm gonna ask, I'm, I, I, Hussein, I want you to, no, I want you to answer next, and then Tony, I want you to answer. Hussein, I'd like you to actually um, focus, if you can, more specifically on the idea, because we've, we've been on the same uh, days before speaking about the, uh, speaking about the tribes. Look, without U.S. forces being on the ground, how do how does uh, Washington actually get its allies on board to fight the Iranian structure as they did during the surge? Yeah, I was I was going to mention that, ah, but yeah, okay. the, 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 <laughs> you asked. Uh, well, you know, my thinking is that uh, since the uh, war in Vietnam, the United States has been unlucky with allies. We always get the ones that get beaten, and I think the the first experiments where the U.S. had a potent force that's an ally was during the surge. And that's why I'm advocating, yeah. replicating that, uh, that model. Um, and you know, uh, these tribes, they are everywhere. Uh, Tony was talking about the, 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 the ones who are fighting in uh, northeastern Lebanon. Uh, well, these are tribes who go all the way down to, uh, to the fork that's between Israel, Syria, and, and Lebanon. 
And then from there, they go all the way across the Shuf Mountains to Khaldi, which is to the south of Beirut. And, and they, they're, they're around Golan, and then they go all the way to the uh, north of Jordan. And these tribes are different from the other tribes that are you know, in what we call Jazeera, the Deir mm -hmm. Zur area and, and these areas. Because the other tribes are connected to Iraq. These tribes are independent. Some of them are connected to Saudi Arabia through marriage, but not all of them. So these tribes, the most important of which are Naim, uh, they've been. And just I mean, these are Sunni tribes. They're Sunni they're tribes. Uh, they fought with Sultan Bashar al Atrash, the Druze leader in the south of, of Syria against the French. They fought with with the uh, with Walid Jumlat militia, the Druze militia, throughout the civil war. And now these guys, <coughs> most of them, are fighting alongside the Syrian rebels uh, because you know they live on both sides of the borders. Uh, which scared the woohoo out of Walid Jumblat because, you know, I mean, I mean, he knows that these guys are fighters and there was some sort of, of revenge and clashes between the Druze of Syria and these tribes. Mm -hmm. So Jumblat just went, uh, 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 you know, to these tribes to, to make sure that he's uh, on the right side and, uh, you know, to renew the, re the, 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 the relationship with them. So, uh, so there are tribes everywhere, and not only Sunni tribes, by the way. You know, in, in, in the Bikha Valley, in Balak, there are Shia tribes who have never been part of Hezbollah. They have this, this sort of detente with Hezbollah, but they've never been part of Hezbollah. So uh, if we manage to get allies from these people, as opposed to the previous allies that we used to get, like in Iraq, when you got you know, all these Chalabis and Alawis, and you know, the, uh, the opposition that we call the, the facts opposition at the time, you know, with, with no actual uh, power on the ground. I mean, these people are on the ground. They need sponsor. They're looking for sponsor. So, you know, like uh, Michael's saying, if we look at them, they, they'll probably respond and, and look back at us. Tony, did you want to... Uh, yeah, uh, look, I mean, what, uh, yeah, to come yeah. back to your article today, though, another thing, and this is probably going to... Well, we'll see. We'll probably have time for another question. But one of our problems isn't just that we're not looking for allies but that we're taking sides yeah. against our oh, allies. Yeah. Yeah. Look, two things. First, the nature of the enemies that we're fighting, right, the nature of the warfare, let's not blow it out of proportion, right? I mean, including the, 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 you know, the, the super Wehrmacht of the Syrian Arab uh, forces, okay? I mean, <laughs> please, we are talking here about, this is the same type of warfare since the 70s, that has been playing out in the region, the in Lebanon. The 1770s. Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> No, no, I mean like in the modern period, right? We're talking about people on jeeps with dushkas and rocket-propelled grenades and mortars and improvised. This is the same warfare, right? We're not talking here about sophisticated, uh, you know, mass uh, World War II scale warfare. Very small. Hezbollah is very small. <laughs> Okay, we like people talk about yeah, no, a million fighters in. Come on, man, they have f five, six thousand fighters tops. Okay, a thousand of which now are dead. Uh, uh, Two hundred people are deployed in in a particular offensive. We are not talking huge number. The scale is this small. You can affect it dramatically and quickly. It's not that hard to do. Uh, these guys, they're fighting in the Kalamun uh, uh, hills, for instance. I mean, they, they fight with the same type of weaponry. The vaunted Quds Force fights with the same type of weaponry, same type of tactics. It's not that hard to build up a force of 10, 15,000, deploy it in a particular theater and supply it. And, you know, what we're giving the Badr organization and Asa'i Bahl al-Haq in Iraq now, instead of giving it to them, give it to the other side. So why don't the Israelis entirely ruin the Quds Force position in Kunaitra. I mean, if we've heard over the last couple right. of weeks that, you know, IRGC and Hezbollah are moving on Kunaitra, why doesn't, is it just because they're deterred by the Americans or what? No, I think, look, it, I, I think mean, the again, strike if it's is... Not that, if it's not that strong a position, why don't they just ruin and say, enough of this? Look, you know? uh, the... And every time we see an Iranian officer up here, he's going to get well, the that, same Well, that was the message, right? I mean, that was the message of the strike in, in, on January 18th, that uh, if we see you guys here, we're going we're gonna to kill you. That's it. You know, the, the infrastructure that the, that the Iranians are building in the Golan is not yet up and running. They have the Syria Hezbollah. They have these, uh, these uh, 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 there's a disproportionate number of Syrian Shiites. It's a very small community, but it's, uh, they're lapping them up now. 
Uh, and, you know, when we say small community, even if you have 100,000, right? I mean, that's significant fighting power, but I don't know if they... Not even 50,000. Uh, no, yeah. but I mean, even yeah. if you pull 10,000 of these guys, you have a force on the ground if you want to do it. It's still bigger than Hezbollah, I mean, or, or around the same size as Hezbollah. Um, so, uh, but, you know, how much of that is really up and running in the Golan? It hasn't... They were trying to set something up. They will continue to try to set something up. And I think if these are, this is, if these trends are going to continue, that's where we're going to, that, that's esa essentially what the Rabinovich and Inbar articles were about, right? If these trends are going to continue, Israel is going to have to ma uh, make a call, right? And so one of the options is, well, okay, we're going to tell them we're going to take out Assad and then, right. and then sort of sh shuffle things a little bit. Uh, the, the, the issue of the tribes, just very quickly, the people are on the border with Jordan now. Whatever you can, whatever you want to call them, you know, the Yarmouk brigades, the, Yar, the brigades of so forth and so forth, the whatever, or Jabhat al-Nusra. All these guys are local clans, okay, and they're boys from local clans in Dara. And they know them, and the Jordanian intel knows them, and everybody knows that they didn't, they didn't come down from Mars, right, okay, because we just said uh, Al-Qaeda, it, you know, it doesn't mean Peshawar. These guys are from there. Those, they, they, they work there. They operate there. It's very easy uh, to, to tap into these structures and sort of divert them in a, in a, in a direction yeah, that you want. Which is presumably what the Jordanians are doing and, and, and uh, well, the Israelis that, I mean, as well. That's so. what, fairly or unfairly, rightly or wrongly, that's what they're being accused of right now, specifically uh, by the Syrians and the Iranians. And we're amplifying their message, of course. Uh, by saying that, hey, you, Jordan, you're working with, stop, uh, working with, uh, with stop working with Nusra, you're supporting right. terror, which is the same thing we did with the Turks earlier and, and so on. Uh, I think this is going to be our last question, sir. If you could just hold on and wait for the microphone to come up. And if you would also identify yourself, and please be certain to keep it a question and not a long comment. Emil Baroudi, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I gathered from what Michael was saying about when he was talking about different umbrellas going on now in the Middle East. <coughs> did, you, did you mean that the Israelis want Bashar al-Assad um, out of the picture and they're not doing so because the U.S. is pressuring them, you know, to keep Tehran happy? No, I was referring to... Uh, uh, I was referring to what Tony was talking about, about the, um, about the Iranians setting up on the Golan. And the 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 Israelis are nervous about the uh, about the Iranian presence um, on on the Golan, the Israeli Iranian Hezbollah presence on the on the Golan. And w what I was saying is that if the if the Israelis decided that this was intolerable to them, and they wanted to push the Iranians out, they would find themselves. I'm I'm almost certain that they would find themselves um, at loggerheads with President Obama. Who would consider that? Who would consider that very problematic for him? But do you think the Israelis want to get rid of Assad? I, I, no, I didn't say. Uh, I, I didn't say they, that they want to get rid of Assad. I said that they they, they don't want the Iranians on their border. Tony, do you want to answer well, that I mean, quickly? Because I, I know you yeah. have something you think about. Well, no, that, that's the debate, right? I mean, so there's been a big debate in Israel now. If you if you want to believe Itamar Rabinovich's take is that there's been a split in, in, in Israel. There's a split in Israel. On the one hand, you have people who are worried about the sort of the ISIS-Sunni, uh, so on and so forth, uh, threat coming in from the Golan, although nobody talks about it as an imminent threat, you know, so it's some, something down the road. And then you had the other side that are worried about the Iranians as the foremost threat and therefore see Bashar al-Assad as part of that system and therefore that needs to be rolled back. And according to Rabinovich's take, is, it's that this has created a, uh, the consensus that emerged from this is to say, look, we're going we're gonna to stay back. Uh, we're not going to tip the balance on the ground uh, in the war. But at the same time, if you measure the interference, the operations that Israeli, the Israeli Air Force has taken in Syria, they have been exclusively, exclusively against Iran and Assad. Not one target has been hit by the IAF that's not been Iranian or Assad, right? Now, the difference is, well, not always, because sometimes like what happened in the South, in, uh, you know, whenever there's a cross-border uh, fire against Israel, the Israelis always hit back at Assad positions. So, uh, but the point is, those tactical strikes highlight 
of strategic priority. Strategic priority is Iran. Now what Rabinovich is saying and Imbar and others are saying, that we have come to a head, that this is a moment w where the, not only is the Iranian threat the, th the threat, the strategic threat, it also is the immediate th threat. It's the clear and present threat. Unlike, let's say, what might happen with an ISIS, which, by the way, does not exist in the South. There is no ISIS in southern Syria. Um, the, if, if it's strategic and imminent, then you have to make a choice. You have to reach a decision. That, um, um, this is what the, art, uh, the synthesis that Rabinovich is, is, is brought with his article. Um, and if you are going to reach that decision, then you have two choices. You're either going to hit hard in Lebanon, and then you're going to have a full-fledged uh, war, or you have another option. The other option is you're going to signal to the Iranians that if you guys uh, continue uh, pressing into, this, into the Golan and South Syria and sort of disrupt this de facto buzz, buffer zone that we and the Jordanians have down there, uh, then we're going to hit at Assad, not tactically, but in a matter that affects the course of the war, meaning that would threaten his hold on power. So if this now is the first step in that sort of process of thinking, uh, it places the United States and Israel on, uh, on uh, uh, sort of, a, this is what Mike was talking about. It puts them at loggerheads. Uh, uh, it's, it's a trajectory towards, uh, if under the Obama administration, uh, they will find themselves on opposing sides. Um, and that's, and that's what, what's being recognized. There's no way that you can reconcile it. Now, will they move? Uh, totally will Israel move there? I don't know. We'll see. All right. Um, I think that's a, uh, yeah. a very good place to end it, and I want to thank uh, thank the three of you again, and of course, thanking Hudson Institute, and I thank uh, I thank all of you for coming this afternoon. Thank you.